Arose thou art sick, the invisible worm that flies in the night in the howling storm has found out thy bed of crimson joy, and his dark secret love does thy life destroy. It's easy to understand because it's about a rose which is sick, but it can apply to all that, all sorts of aspects of sumptuous beauty that has something rotten at its core. Political cutting is always the art of the obvious. You're always trying to make a point that you're not trying to hide the point, as I did with this one. You, you take the framework and you graft it on to your own particular purpose. I've crudely taken it to apply to the new labour. It was a very specific moment about new labour coming out of that um, conflict, the Kosovo war, and me being sceptical about the whole thing. I can't think of a sort of contemporary equivalent to Blake. I mean, there isn't, who, who can you think of who's, who's that intensely involved in the world of literature at the same time um, whose visual work is actually part and parcel of what he's doing. So you see the way he did it, he, he engraved it and beautifully sort of delineated it and illustrated it. And you see that sort of unity about his work which is just perfection. I mean, you just, you just fall down on your knees and think, Christ, how can, you, how can people do that? That's just wonderful. The Newton one, which is the one I've used as a reference, it's a very potent image of this, this magnificent naked body of Newton hunched and focused down onto this narrow point with a pair of dividers. What Blake was trying to say about Newton was that Newtonian physics were based on very straightforward mechanistic mathematical principles. But he was saying this is a narrow view, this doesn't take into account the, the full spiritual wonderful spectrum of, of, of the world. So I just took that meaning and grafted it onto the current education debate which is about the obsession with measuring and the obsession with testing. The way he used imagery was so direct. I admire that directness and that attempt always to communicate his point of view. My friend and I were walking in the countryside when suddenly we saw three little figures. A silvery disc-shaped object, about 10 meters in diameter. I'm extremely interested in the errors of experience that are, for better or worse, called visionary or hallucinatory. The object hovered at a tilted angle while the two occupants looked at me sternly, but not in an unkind fashion. The witness piece that I made is the result of a number of years' research, collecting first-hand accounts of people who have seen unidentified flying objects. The UK of a black flying triangle displaying three orange apex lights hovering out at sea. It seemed to be all around us and it was bright enough to cast distinct shadows. Somebody said to me that if William Blake were alive now, he would be one of the first people to have talked about seeing unidentified flying objects. It had portals, lights were flashing, white and red. A large crowd of 100 people also saw this. It's a rather mysterious uh, pencil drawing that I find particularly wonderful is a man who taught Blake painting in his dreams. Now the curious thing about this picture is that it shows the head and shoulders of a human type being with what we would nowadays call a third eye in the center of the forehead. It's very curious because this whole notion of the third eye wasn't really known in, in Europe at that time. The explanation that Tate gives for the third eye in the middle of the forehead is that it represents inspiration and that the drawing, in fact, is a self-portrait of Blake himself in his so-called metaphysical form, that is, in his, in his spiritual form. But Blake's friend, John Linnell, claims it's a picture of somebody else, a mysterious being who visited Blake while he was dreaming and taught him how to paint. So you have two different versions. But it's the image that I think is the most intriguing. If 
for me to come across uh, something means that I immediately want to set it to music. I first entered the world of Blake when I wrote about 20 years ago for my three-year-old nephew in the Songs of Innocence, The Lamb, which must be the most famous poem, I think, that, he, that he's written. Little lamb, who made thee? Dost thou know who made thee? Everything Blake did, it came from a divine source. When I'm setting Blake, because I think he composed his poetry in a very similar way to the way I write music, it comes to me fully grown. He painted and he wrote poetry. All these uh, spiritual arts um, contained in, in the work of one person. One finds in Blake, one can interpret him in various different ways, uh, but, as, but they are spiritual ways, it's a metaphysical way of experiencing all his poetry. I think this quality that Blake has um, is to do with what the Sufis call the, the eye of the heart. Uh, that is that the mind goes into the heart and it's there that is the seat of inspiration. One of the odd things is that I share a name with Blake, but uh, one can only struggle to write poetry like he does. He's an inspiring model, I think. In his lifetime, he was patronized, he was condescended to, people thought he was mad. But, you know, the ruins of time build mansions in eternity, he said, and his work has that eternality. I like The Clod and the Pebble. Uh, it's not the best known of Blake's songs of experience, and, and, and its language is a little more old-fashioned than you could sometimes get. Um, but it's about the very important thing, two kinds of love, selfish love and selfless love. The poem, I think, asks us, what do we want to be? Do we want to be clods? Do we want to be pebbles? The, the clod is trodden underfoot by cattle. The pebble lives clear and bright in a stream. Maybe the point is that we ha all have the capacity for both kinds of love at different times in our life. We, we may behave differently towards other people. To be always this sort of meek, giving person may be self-destructive in the end. And, and this is what I love about the poem. It's full of resonance and, uh, uh, you know, complexity. Uh, but the surface is, it is so simple. Love seeketh not itself to please, nor for itself hath any care, but for another gives its ease and builds a heaven in hell's despair. So sang a little clod of clay, trodden with the cattle's feet. But a pebble of the brook warbled out these meters meet. Love seeketh only self to please, to bind another to its delight, joys in another's loss of ease, and builds a hell in heaven's despite. The Proverbs from Hell seems to be just a collection of all his best one-liners. 
they're quite contemporary in that sense, they're like just little sound bites. The uh, Road of Excess leads to the Palace of Wisdom is one that uh, <laughs> resonates with me for some reason or another. There's another line is that you can't know what is enough until you know what is too much, or words to that effect. You know, I think you only learn moderation by, by going past that point. Which is why the marriage of heaven and hell, mm. what he's essentially saying, you know, heaven's had its say for quite a while now. That's really, you know, what I was drawn to, the idea of flipping things on their head and the devil being the wise party, the one that hasn't had his fair say, especially, you know, in the late 18th century. It was just a completely revolutionary idea now as much as then. I don't want to die. What we're doing, we're going to be writing a new piece, Blake-inspired piece. Yeah, and we're going to do um, a new arrangement of Jerusalem. But I have a, I have a piece which I wrote for a, a movie called Photographing Fairies. I was very much inspired by Blake when I wrote the music for that film. I'm now resurrecting that music and reworking it for an album that I'm doing. And we are working together to sort of create this, to do it live. The music was inspired in the first place by Blake. But then um, it evolved into an idea about dying that was really a combination of um, the road of excess leads to the palace of wisdom and the road of excess leading some people to the road of death. <laughs> so the lyrics which are written for it, which Ewan McGregor recites on the piece of music, are to do with people who died famously young and kind of what a waste it was. I don't want to die while I'm still young. There's a lot to chew on in each line of the uh, marriage of heaven and hell. You know, there's a hazelnut in every bite, as it were. Far too much meaning in what he, what he says. I mean, you know, you, you could use one, one line of the marriage of heaven and hell and make a whole song out of it. You know, I think that's, you know, with pop music, you've got, you've got to have one idea and say it three times. You know, he's saying 30 ideas one time. I first came across William Blake at school with the hymn Jerusalem that both the, my primary school and secondary school had as their kind of anthem. And um, it was the only hymn that I joined in and shouted a lot. It's sort of really rousing. But during the 60s, when I started to look at pictures and painting and record covers and everything else, Blake was very kind of psychedelic for my age group and so seemed very accessible and not posh art, but art for us. In some paintings you split little corners up and enjoy little bits and then stand back and look at the whole thing. With this picture I look at the whole painting. There's splodges of wonderful blues and lilacs and pinks, almost like you, you get with an oil painting, but it's so delicate and watery and there's this huge griffin and beautiful Beatrice standing at the back like Bodicea. I love the way all the women look really happy and free, not a corset in sight. They're not doing the Lady Di kind of shy, coy thing. He's made them people and I love the way he appears to believe in human beings. I just love it, and every time you look at it, you see something else. It's very theatrical for me. Maybe that's what it is. If anyone could convince me that there was a God, it would be Blake, because he saw creativity and the spiritual life as God. Um, and I kind of agree with that. William Blake was a prophetic figure. As a prophet of liberation, he was opposed to monarchy, he was opposed to an established church, he didn't like soldiers, he didn't like slavery, he was against racism. Uh, he was a great enemy of exploitation, and very interestingly, he, be he believed in sexual liberation, but was bitterly opposed to prostitution. And of course, he's a marvelous poet, he was a marvelous engraver, but his ideas had a very profound effect. 
He did support the French Revolution, was seen wearing the cap of liberty. He was a contemporary of Tom Paine, the great uh, writer of the age of reason and uh, the rights of man. Mary Wollstonecraft, the great woman's leader. So if you uh, summarize him, he was a dissenter. When I was very young, before I knew anything about him, uh, this sort of official view was, oh, well, he was an artist who went mad. Actually, he was somebody of great significance, great importance, and somebody who, even today, gives people hope and inspires them. If you look at the, the, the Jerusalem poem, this uh, recreation of history, the link with the Bible, the uh, pleasure in our own country, England, it's not a nationalist uh, hymn, but it is saying where we live is a lovely place. And then the idea that we are being overseen all the time by a countenance divine and uh, the hills are clouded, whether that's a reference to the weather or the pollution of the 19th century, I do not know. And then the dark satanic mills, a bitter condemnation of the conditions of working people. And then a call to arm, bring me my bow of burning gold, bring me my arrows of desire. The idea that I do, uh, 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 an aspiration is an arrow that you fire, bring me my spear, and then, oh, clouds unfold bring me my chariot of fire. The language is, uh, is prophetic and revolutionary in character. And then, I, everyone who sings it, I will not cease from mental fight, nor shall my sword sleep in my hand, till we have built Jerusalem, till we have built Jerusalem. We've got to do it together in England's green and pleasant land. I mean, it's tremendously powerful, tremendously powerful. It's got everything. The interest in Blake now and the celebrations that are going on of his life are an indication of what relevance he has and will continue to have as the human race comes to terms with a new set of tools and realizes that the choice is between good and evil. And Blake would say between faith and reason, but however you interpret it, it is between good and evil and he certainly spoke for good and saw good in people, believed it was in everybody anyway, you brought it out who didn't impose it from above. And for that, I personally am deeply grateful. Continuing our William Blake night on BBC Knowledge, a private view of the great romantic next. Le meilleur du cinéma européen. Lo mejor de cine europeo. Das Beste vom europäischen Kino. Il meglio del cinema europeo. Complete films from the best of European cinema. Kino. This Thursday at 10.30 on BBC Knowledge. The gods have given me almost everything. I had genius, a distinguished name, high social position, brilliancy, intellectual daring. I made art a philosophy and philosophy and art. There was nothing I said or did that didn't make people wonder. Unlock the mind of a genius. Simon Callow hosts an evening of special programs. Wild Night, Friday the 24th on BBC Knowledge. Exclusive to BBC Knowledge, a night of celebration of the unique romantic British poet and artist, William Blake. Hello, and welcome to BBC Knowledge on a special evening of programmes dedicated to one of the greatest artists Britain has ever produced. This exceptionally powerful painter, wonderfully inventive craftsman, and poet of singular brilliance was William Blake. A literary and artistic genius whose many paintings and poems, including The Tiger and, of course, Jerusalem, 
still occupy a unique place in the British national psyche more than 180 years after they were created. We begin our William Blake night here in his beloved London with a tour of an exhibition that gives us fresh insights into the mind of someone who was a multimedia artist almost two centuries before the term was invented. In the company of four eminent guests, Tim Marlowe now explores Blake at the Tate, a private view. In 1809, the poet, painter and mystic William Blake staged his first exhibition of paintings and watercolours. By any standards, the show was a disaster. Hardly anyone came, nothing was sold, and the only review described Blake as a lunatic. But he shouldn't have been surprised, because he never had any success as an artist in his lifetime. And although he was unquestionably a visionary, he'd be astonished to know that now he's the subject of a major exhibition here at Tate Britain. This is the largest William Blake show ever. Incredibly exciting to have such a large show. It includes all the favourites. We have all 100 plates of Jerusalem. We have Newton. We have the well-known poem, Tiger, Tiger, Burning Bright. Why would you do a Blake show now? It's a good moment to do William Blake exhibition. He's always relevant. He has many admirers across many generations. And people are continually intrigued and excited by his work. The show has been arranged by four themes. Many were formidable works, which is the illuminated books. Chambers of the Imagination, where we get inside his head. The Lambeth section, which looks at technical aspects of Blake's work. And the show begins with the Gothic. Though he lived in the late 18th century, Blake was in many ways a medieval artist. His interest lay in the world of the spiritual rather than the visible. He not only believed in angels, he actually thought he saw them and he painted them as well. Blake was fascinated by the art and architecture of the Middle Ages. The arches and tracery of Gothic cathedrals and their flowing statues inspired a style which runs throughout his work. In the medieval, he found the union of art and spirituality for which he strived. It also provided him with a rich source of subjects to rework and reinvent, from Dante's Divine Comedy to the Apocalypse. Blake's distinctive style began to take shape when, as an apprentice to an engraver in the 1770s, he was asked to make drawings of the medieval royal tombs of Westminster Abbey. Blake spent years in the Abbey drawing the tombs from every possible vantage point, even standing on them to draw them from above. Not surprisingly, one of Blake's earliest visions was in Westminster Abbey. Christopher, hello. Is this, um, is this how you see Blake? He seems to be of another world, doesn't he? Yeah, in some ways, he's, he's sort of visionary. He's, he's, seeing, he's seeing things which we're not seeing, and the light's directly on his bald pate. It's rather strong light, so it's obviously deliberate. And he's also a tradesman. He doesn't really look like a, a pucker artist. He looks like the guy who couldn't get into the Royal Academy, who, who did engraving for a living. You know, he's a bit of an out-of-towner, don't you think? He looks a bit yeah. provincial. A man on the margins, I think. He is a bit, and uh, most artists of the day thought he was a joke basically. Uh, you know, the, the kind of guy who walks around with sandwich boards in Oxford Street saying the end of the world is at hand. They thought he was that sort of person. You're interested in the Gothic imagination. People say the fact that Blake claimed to have seen angels shows that he was deranged. How, how do you interpret that? Well, A man just with a very fertile imagination? Well, he certainly saw Gothic angels. 
This is wonderful because we, ha we have the angels who have B Blake's own view of the tomb. It's as if he's fusing those two parts of his own interests. Yeah, it, it's based on a rather obscure biblical reference. It's from Exodus 25 where there's a, a verse about, and the cherubim shall spread their wings over the mercy seat. And he sees that as a prophecy of Christ in the tomb with the angels, for which there's no biblical justification at all. So it's an excuse to do angels over this body. So it's a triangle. It's a Gothic arch with this shape. The heads are the pivots, you know, it's as if they're on a sort of gear, so they're like this. And there's this real feel of hovering, of motion. And what I love about it is the, the fold of the garment and seeing the physical feet and legs through it. So it's sort of ethereal, they're see-through angels, they're like a vision. They're not, you know, solid sort of Renaissance angels. These are visionary in the Gothic style. So he really pulls it off, I think. Across here is a much more rigorous and frightening, horrific vision. Absolutely. Now this is definitely the dark side of Blake's imagination, isn't it? I think, the, for me, the red dragon and the woman of the sun is the finest thing that Blake ever did. It's astonishingly powerful and very, very frightening. Yeah, it depicts a moment from the book of Revelation. The red dragon appears and uh, is waiting for uh, the woman clothed in the sun to give birth um, so that the dragon can destroy the child, the redeemer, when it arrives. So you get this huge macho figure with this giant sort of pterodactyl wings, sinewy wings, which are bursting out at the side of the picture. The picture can't contain them with sort of gothic -y shapes inside each of the wings, like little gothic arches. And underneath, this, this woman clothed in the sun, one foot on the moon, one on the sun, standing on the sea, big macho figure with all these sinewy muscles and this horrible tail coming out of his backbone, going round the girl. It's, it's an image of sort of enveloping, of, of rape, actually. And I mean, for me, this is the, one of the archetypal images of rape in Western art. And these funny heads growing out of his chest, like malignant growths and these funny ram's horns. It's an it's, it's, it's extraordinary image. It's, it's so kind of powerful and scary, and it goes well beyond the imagery of the Book of Revelation. Do you think this is a personal demon for Blake, then, or is it an archetype? I think, like everything in Blake, it's based on archetypal imagery, but he's getting something personal out of his system by doing it. I mean, it goes well beyond a job of work. This is, It's an inner demon uh, that, that, that's coming out. This watercolour is kept in the Brooklyn Museum. They've lent it to this exhibition. And in, in the novel Red Dragon by Thomas Harris, the first of his serial killer novels, Hannibal Lecter, the man who later appeared in The Silence of the Lambs, goes into Brooklyn Museum, has an obsession with this image, and actually eats the watercolour to ingest himself the, the vampire. So the serial killer eats the vampire to take his vitality. So it kind of lives in the bloodstream of contemporary culture as well as being part of uh, late 18th, early 19th century culture. For me, it brings it all together. It's got Blake's absolute obsession with the Bible, the fact that he then moved beyond the Bible into his own personal vision. It hooks into the history of horror. Horror, history of art, Blake, unbeatable combination. This is the one. These images after Dante's Divine Comedy, many people think they're the best things Blake ever did. Do you go along with that? They're very strong. They're not very strong as illustrations. They're very strong as William Blake because he actually subtly alters the story to suit his own purposes. I suppose the most famous one is about the circle of the lustful. You've got these two lovers who've been caught in adultery and have been condemned to the second circle of hell, the circle of lust. Only they're inside this rather nice orb, clutching each other in a permanent embrace. Uh, there's Virgil, the guide, through the Inferno, and there's Dante, who's fainted because he takes so much pity on them when he hears their story that he passes out. In Dante, um, you know, they jolly well should go to hell because they've been adulterous. But Blake didn't believe that. Uh, in fact, he said, Dante saw devils where I only see good. The two characters are whooshed up in this sort of whirlwind, which is actually referred to in, uh, in the original Inferno, and off they go up to heaven. So if you stand back from this, there's earth, there's the sky, there's the underworld, and here's these figures coming out, and it looks like a giant snake, you know, original sin, and these are the scales of the snake. So as you walk up to this, you think, oh, it's, a, it's some sort of coiling giant snake, but actually it's the whirlwind of lovers. Dante thought it was a punishment for people to relive their sin forever. But they all look as though they're having a fantastic time, you know. So, I mean, if this is hell, lead me to it.
In 1791, Blake and his wife Catherine moved to number 13 Hercules Buildings in the South London borough of Lambeth. The seven years spent here were to be the most creative and productive period of his life. Blake's dead brother Robert came to him in a vision and showed him a new way of working. This inspired Blake to create a process he called illuminated printing, which allowed him to illustrate, print and publish his own poetry. Now creatively independent, he produced some of his finest work, including the Songs of Innocence and the Songs of Experience. But although this was a fruitful time in Blake's life, it was also a period of insecurity and fear. The works he produced were written during a period of national unrest and paranoia in the wake of the American War of Independence, the French Revolution and the madness of our own King George. The poems Blake wrote at this time are often complex, sometimes obscure and full of inflammatory and revolutionary ideas. Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forests of the night, what immortal hand or eye could frame thy fearful symmetry? It's a wonderful poem, that. I remember reading it as a child. And there's something fantastically childlike about the poem, but also Blake's illustrations for it, which are here, where the tiger's not this savage beast at all, but some like some giant cuddly kitty cat. But as with everything with Blake, you have to read between the lines. Things are never quite what they seem. And so, of course, the tiger is an image of childishness. It's also an image of ferocity, of fear, of the unknown. But because of that, Blake's using it as a symbol of revolution. But this revolutionary fervor that dominates this room is something that Blake wonderfully encapsulates in the poem, The Tiger, because he says revolution's a good thing. And in effect, he tames the tiger. Now, the other broad theme of the room is London itself and Blake's living in Lambeth in the 1790s, where he produces some of his great work. And he also writes an epic poem around London where he shows the city as something that's afflicted. And he writes, I wander through each chartered street near where the chartered Thames does flow and mark in every face I meet marks of weakness, marks of woe. And the final theme, or the final subject that emerges wonderfully in this room, that for me is the hub, the engine of the whole exhibition, is not just how Blake's mind works, but how physically he works as an artist, his processes. Traditionally, the process of printing was a team effort, a kind of mini-industry of the kind that Blake despised. And on the walls of the exhibition here are a series of prints made along these industrial lines in 1793. But next to them, behind me, there's these amazing prints by Blake of America, a prophecy, one of his poems about the American Civil War, but visionary, of course. And it's Blake's mark and this expressionistic sense that you get. And this is because Blake had used a press just like this in front of me in his home in Lambeth, together with his wife. And when I look at this, I imagine the man with his eyes ablaze, tugging away, producing his own pamphlets. And all around us in the cabinets here, we see the plates that show how Blake had to think and how he had to produce words and images all in reverse. And then you transfer in your mind from the cabinets to the printing press itself. And Blake had this source of great pride that he, unlike his heroes, Milton and Shakespeare, could produce his own works, could publish his own works. And this liberated him. It made him a man apart. Blake's vivid imagination was the wellspring and the driving force of his work. And his assertion that the imagination is not a state, it is the human existence itself, is the theme of the third section of the exhibition. Blake claimed to have seen angels in a tree at the age of 10, and from here his imaginative world grew until he'd created an entire mythology, peopled with characters drawn from the Bible, English history, and the wild creations of his mind. He created an alternative story of the world, reinterpreting real events and inventing new ones, to recast history as a spiritual and mythic struggle. Much of it's obscure, 
but various key characters do stand out. Albion, the ancient and poetic name for Britain, is personified by Blake. Jerusalem is Albion's female counterpart and the inspiration of all mankind. Urizen is a tyrannical vision of God the Father. He stands for reason, which to Blake limits the imagination. While Loss, the artist and creator, is the embodiment of poetry and the arts. Marina, I love this life mask of William Blake. Uh, maybe I'm being too simple about it, but it always seems to me as if his imagination is trying to burst out of his head. It's rather an effect, I think, of this idea of being covered in some clay that they made the life mask with, that he's ended up looking like a blind seer. Everything is concentrated inwardly. His, his mind is bulging with dreams and fantasies. It's very easy to read, I think, into that great brow, the kind of teeming phantasmagoria that he then produced. And then, of course, he's looking in on himself and behind him are the fruits of his imagination, these extraordinary large prints that he did. Do you think he's the great imaginationist in British art, or is his position slightly overstated? Oh, no, I don't think the position's overstated at all. I mean, there's an extraordinary convergence of, of not only skills, but um, s simple um, powers of imagination, creating a personal and private mythology out of an enormous legacy of different random reading. There is a kind of haphazard quality to the mythology, and I think that one doesn't have to feel that... Um, but it's a sort of a fault to be lost in it. No, I'm relieved to hear that, actually, because I often get lost, but I, I like that sensation. Do you think he was mad? Do you think that the imagination that he seems to portray and the mythology he creates is a sign of a mind unhinged? No, I don't think he was mad, because he functioned perfectly well in the world. I mean, that's, I think he was exceptional, and I think he was inspired, and he also chose to be inspired. He chose to write a kind of poetry that depended on setting himself up in the tradition of bards. Blake is very unusual in his personal systems, but how I came to him really was because he's part of the actual English tradition. There's a lot of English mythology, not just his own personal inventions, but, you know, he's famous for having seen a fairy funeral. This is a reasonably literal depiction of Nebuchadnezzar from the Old Testament, but it's still full of Blake's imagination, isn't it? Well, I think that he's really created the image. In the Bible, the prophecy is that Nebuchadnezzar, who built Babylon and the ziggurats and the hanging gardens of Babylon, was a huge despot, um, was going to be reduced to the condition of a beast, and he was going to grow eagles' feathers and birds' claws. But the whole crouching, the going on all fours and the beard dragging like that, and the whole terror in the man's face is part of Blake's vision. The whole of the background in these wonderful rich colours, this sort of marvellous cobalts and touches of crimson, is, this is a very mysterious space. I mean, one doesn't really know where it's taking place at all. It's almost looking forward to abstraction. He was this marvellous um, inventor of different media. I mean, this is an, the extraordinary thing about him, is he was an artisan, he was a craftsman. He wasn't just, he wasn't like Nebuchadnezzar, he wasn't a sort of wild hermit in a cave, um, going mad and having visions with staring eyes. He was a very practical and very brilliant innovator. There's a real sense of drama, of staging, which I find in all the mythological works, even in this wonderful image through here of Albion. Well, he uses the body very dramatically. There's a sense of the gesture and expression. It's really thinking through the way the body expresses the inner state. It's called Albion Rose, or sometimes Glad Day. And Glad Day, of course, catches the wonderful radiance of this image. And Albion was a giant who Blake decided was a, was a kind of um, personification 
of England. And here you see him in the undivided rainbow, in his glory, in a kind of wonderful halo of light. And it's Blake in his mood that, you know, I first loved about Blake in the Songs of Innocence, where he says things like, you know, mercy has a human heart and pity a human face and love the human form divine and peace the human dress. Well, he often didn't say such optimistic things. In fact, three quarters of his work is dark and despairing. But there are these flashes of light and these flashes of hope. And this wonderful image is one of them. The last section of the exhibition presents the complete illuminated books that make up Blake's greatest achievement as a poet and an artist. The songs of innocence and experience are the best known and most accessible of his poems. Within the simple lyrics lies a subtle play of opposing and unresolved ideas, what Blake calls the two states of the human soul. The blossom of innocence becomes the sick rose in experience. The epic Jerusalem is Blake's longest and most complex poem. Comprising a hundred plates of densely written text, the poem is like a series of ethereal dreams. It can be read as the progress of a soul towards enlightenment, but it's also part of Blake's prophetic vision of England, or Albion, as a sacred nation. Hi, Billy. Jim. Incredible colours in these, uh, these plates. And having them all along the wall like this. I just wonder if whether you, you're bothered the fact that these are things to be handled as books, but here they have to be mounted on a wall. Well, I think it's, it's really our perception of what we think of the art of William Blake. And I think that when you look at the exhibition, you have to, you have to understand that the person that we think Blake is is very much a 20th century construct because in his own lifetime these books were hardly seen by anybody they weren't he wasn't greatly appreciated i think we we see him through our own eyes and um i don't think that's a bad thing because i think that the meaning of blake is something that it's very 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 hard to discern if you do follow the narrative in these stories the narrative is very very difficult to keep up with um, because i don't think it was written as a narrative story i think this came to blake straight down onto the paper He's that kind of classic outsider art writer and, and, and painter in that he just gets it down as it comes to him. The visions that come to him, the ideas that come to him, uh, the thoughts that come to him, go, I think, go straight onto the page. It's even sometimes difficult to follow within a page what it is he's going on about. If um, he were alive today, though, do you think he perhaps would be a, a singer-songwriter? He'd, he'd be more of a performer? No, I think he'd be, if he were alive today, he'd be um, working out of a shed somewhere and, and doing page after page of page of this stuff and no one would be really interested in him. Um, people would think he was a bit of a nutter. He would be, uh, uh, you know, the classic outsider. You know, he, he would be writing on scraps of paper. He'd be mumbling to himself in the corner of, of the pub and no one would be taking a, any notice of him at all. Is that what really strikes a chord with you about Blake, that wonderful sense of being a social revolutionary or, or a socialist, a compassionate socialist? Yeah, I mean, the thing that really strikes me about him is he's, he's writing about socialism before ideology. So he's basing it in compassion. I think all left-wing ideology must originally come from a sense of feeling of compassion, humanitarianism. Blake is articulating that uh, before uh, it's been, you know, before Marx, before it was put into uh, um, some kind of uh, ism, you know. He's just expressing how he feels about it. Which of the works here make you feel closest to Blake? Well, there's a number of images of the great man around the exhibition from different times in his life, but there's one particular picture that, for me, sums up who Blake was, or at least it's, it sums up my idea of who Blake was. More than the, more than the life mask. Yeah, more than the, more than the life mask. It's actually a, a, a picture that was the frontispiece of the Songs of Innocence, and it's often called The Shepherd. The image of The Shepherd is... Uh, in a kind of, if you like, an English arcade, he's standing in a sacred grove, there's his sheep, he's walking barefoot, he has his uh, shepherd's flute in his hand. That sounds like a shepherd, but he's looking up to an angel that's up in the treetops there, talking down to him. That's why I think it's, it's Blake. I think the, the reason he's looking back constantly to that um, 
idealised England is because he is seeing the change uh, from a pastoral existence for the English people to an industrial existence. The fact that he was living in London um, as London was enclosing the, the fields and building over the pastures uh, is reflected later in the Songs of Innocence where he writes about the chimney sweep. What do I see? The Briton, Saxon, Roman, Norman amalgamating into my furnaces into one nation, the English. Now, what do you think Blake is getting at in, in this picture? It's called Enitharmon's Lament. In some ways, he's, he's summoning up the, the many people that have come together to, uh, to make the English, which I, I think is a very modern idea. Uh, but he's also put the word Jerusalem in the picture. Now, this is from the Book of Jerusalem itself. And I suppose the question is, does this figure represent Jerusalem? Or is Jerusalem this city in the background, which is um, signified by trilithons uh, from Stonehenge? He's always elusive, isn't he? He is. And again, we want to know what Jerusalem is because we sing the words to the song. And we, we, any idea that might give us another insight into exactly what Blake was getting at when he wrote those words, uh, you know, I think every, everybody would like to have that perspective. In the song Jerusalem, he says, I shall not rest from mental fight, nor shall my sword sleep in my hand. Now, it would be very easy for him to have said, till I have built Jerusalem. But he doesn't. He says, till we have built Jerusalem in England's green and pleasant land. And at that moment, he brings us all into this idea that whatever England we live in, whatever England we inhabit, we could always make it a better place. I think what it is, it's, uh, it's Blake again being all things to all people. You can read your own interpretation into Jerusalem in the ways you can so much of what is in display in this exhibition and it makes it possible for me to feel passionate about it from a left-wing perspective, the WI to use it and uh, for also for the England team to sing it as they walk out in the new Wembley Stadium which uh, I feel it's only a matter of time before we, uh, before we see that. You should learn the words. Go on then, sing it to me. And did those feet in ancient time Walk upon England's pastures green. And is the holy Lamb of God on England's pleasant pastures There's a great fashion at the moment for thematic art exhibitions and the whole purpose is to challenge the orthodoxy of the way that we look at art history. And the best of them, and I would count this very much among the best of thematic shows, challenge the whole way that we view the world around us. And that seems absolutely appropriate for an artist like William Blake, who perhaps above all others in British art, spent his life trying to turn people's whole view of the world inside out and on its head.